Hey, 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 everybody. Welcome to the Recovery Clinic. Your host, Jimmy McGill, and me, Chris Dickey, bringing you important discussions about all things recovery. The Recovery Clinic is a way to stay connected during these disconnected times. There is literally no reason, y'all, that we should be on an island of one during this pandemic. We want you to participate. There's no social isolation here. If you have questions, comments or anything you want to say, drop them in the chat and we want to discuss them. Like always, I want to encourage you to download the Narkansaw app. It's a great resource for prevention, treatment and recovery. Uh, it, and you can also uh, potentially save a life with it. There's uh, steps to reverse an overdose. So you could literally be walking around with uh, that antidote in your pocket. I also want you to go to visit www.arkansastakeback.org for even more valuable resources. Uh, there's some things to uh, stay connected uh, during uh, this pandemic. And Jimmy, hey, that's all for the housekeeping. Yes, man. You know I, for us, I do. We've got we've got an amazing guest today. Uh, before I do that, I want to thank the people that made this uh, totally possible, the state of Arkansas. Uh, we want to thank the Office of the Drug Director and DHS uh, for giving Chris and I this uh, amazing platform to let our charismatic personalities pop. Uh, if you don't know our guest today, he is uh, widely known around the globe uh, for putting his mouth uh, and actions in the same spot. It's not just about talking it with Tommy Norman. It's about walking how you talk. The video and audio sync up. If you don't know who he is, we've got you a very special treat. Uh, watch this music video and you will get a quick yeah. learner of who Tommy Norman is. If you don't know, now you know. In this real cold world, cold world. where's oh, the love and everyone being equal? Only a few good people in this real cold world. Officer Norman, you are one of those people, so here's a letter to you Thank you for all of your work, from showing love to showing kids what they can really be worth Shout out to Game in Harlem too, that's more good souls No matter your skin tone, you can shine like gold, you can meet life goals You can go make a difference, cause we don't look alike, doesn't mean that we're different Keeping the spirits high when the times get rough Keeping the hope alive without a thing but love A living legend is saying the least Throughout the bad you never failed and kept spreading the peace Throughout it all you kept spreading the hope Throughout it all you kept communities close Continue doing what you do, always hope for the best You showed you can have a heart with a badge on your chest Continue doing what you do, always hope for the best You showed you can have a heart with a badge on your chest Wow. Have a heart with a badge on your chest. Bring him in here. Tommy, there where are you he at? is, man. <laughs> How wow. you doing? I, uh, I can see uh, Chris. Um, hey, can't hey see, Tommy. Can't see Jimmy. Uh, it's okay. If you can't see me, I can hear you. Okay. I, yeah, but uh, You can see me, right? And hear me? I can yeah. see you. And okay. not just me. Several hundred people can see you. It's <laughs> nice, nice, nice. Okay, thank you hey, so much. Tommy, for having me. I'm got, honored. Yeah, we're glad you're here. Looks like you got cleaned up to go from the bedroom to the kitchen. <laughs> can everybody hear me? Yeah, we can hear yeah. you. Okay, all right. Yeah, so Chris, take it away, man. Yeah, well, so we're we're really glad you're here, uh, Tommy. Um, we we want to like every, like everyone else is wondering right. how are you holding I up? Can't hear Chris. You can't hear Chris. Can, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you? Could I, you? Hear, could you hear Chris? I can hear you and Chris. Okay. Hey, um, can you hear me, Tommy? No, he can't hear you. All right. Dang. Ask him what's Do you going. Want on? me to? But I can hear him when I you want to get off and join again. Yeah. 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 Let, let's let's try that because we, we really I'll, want. I'll I'll, uh, I'll be I'll be right back. I'll be right back. All right. <laughs> so we're no. having some. Definitely yeah. some technical issues. Uh, be back on. Jimmy, yeah. you're good with that headset on. What are you doing? So, man, I, I'm practicing yeah. my sportscaster type uh, thing. Potential. Huh? It What'd looks really say, Yeah, yeah. I'm official this morning, man. I'm super excited uh, to have Tommy Norman uh, coming on. And so, hopefully, uh, 
He's back now. Tell me you can hear and see us, Tommy. I, I can. I can. can you hear me? Yes. Tommy, what I was saying is it looks like you got cleaned up to move from the bedroom to the kitchen. <laughs> I did. I did. I did. I did. He, he's trying to keep that shine looking like Jimmy. <laughs> Jimmy, Jimmy, your head will never shine like mine. Just, oh. just go ahead. Ever. <laughs> hey. Ever. There, there it is. <laughs> Hey, I'm honored that, that I was so excited about this. You know, whenever you, um, I shared your conversation a few days ago, and then um, just an honor that I was asked to be on. Let me tell you, you guys are doing great work. So thanks for having me. Oh, man, thank you for being here. I know uh, a lot of people uh, love you and follow you. And, you know, right now, Chris and I have one agenda. Uh, and it's the same thing that you do every day when you get up. Uh, we want to inspire action and change uh, by setting that example. And, you know, social distancing has really torn apart the recovery community. And so you, uh, I know you're vested and believe in what we do. And, and so it just seemed like a natural fit to have you on here. And I know Chris has got some good stuff to talk to you about. Well, thanks so much. Yeah, we're, we're really glad you're here. It, it seems like we're waking up in a different world every time we blink. And so I know everyone is wondering how, how Officer Tommy Norman's holding up during all of this. Um, so, so tell us what you're doing to, to maintain your health and, and uh, mental stability. Well, you know, it helps to have a wife um, that, that uh, you know, six, seven months ago I wasn't married. And so, you, you know, um, and so that helps. It helps to have family that you can connect with. It helps to have friends you can connect with social media, uh, my daily devotional, you know, staying close to God. Um, I'll go ahead and throw food in there. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I've got a lot of that. <laughs> but, you, you know, when, when you have developed such a mindset um, through, you know, your work in the community, as you know, you, you'll have setbacks. And I know this is a setback, but at the same time, I feel like there's a silver lining to all of this. Yep. Uh, I think one of the silver linings is, okay, we can finally slow down, spend time with our family, yeah. get to know ourselves better. Uh, but on the flip side of that is, you know, as Jimmy mentioned, uh, it's, it's also, uh, you know, a setback that some people have a harder time dealing with, but, but I'm doing well, you know, it's, uh, I was already off, as you know, uh, because I injured my knee. Uh, so I was used to being at home, but I was also getting out. But now I'm staying home. And, and so it's uh, it's an adjustment, but it's it, it makes you count your blessings. It's God waking us all up. Absolutely. So talk to us about uh, the All-Star crew. How are they uh, holding up? You know, the All-Star crew, as you know, is a family of four adults, uh, actually five adults. Uh, but um, they... Um, they're they're struggling because they're so used to seeing me almost every day. We yeah. would go out to the barbershop, the beauty shop, the park, uh, you know, and just to hang out. And so I don't think they can mentally really grasp what's going on. But I call and check on them almost every day. Not just them, but everybody in the community. I make sure I keep uh, in phone contact with them, if at all possible, you know, or FaceTime. And a lot of times I'll go live on Instagram and Facebook just to connect with people there. So. Uh, I think we're going to have a big party in the streets and all this is uh, hey. sober. Let me know. I'm in. I like to party <laughs> sober, sober. You're not going right. to arrest me this year. Right. Hey, yeah, we're bringing off the cuffs on this one. Right, right. Um, right. So every, everybody's doing well. They're doing well as can be expected. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, living with purpose is a good principle to take to heart every day. But it, it's it's with all the distractions today, uh, it takes on a new meaning, doesn't it? Yes, it does. It's uh, it really makes you I, I will have to say that I hope that when these restrictions are lifted and we can get back to as close to normal as possible, that I hope people appreciate life even more um, because so many lives are being lost and taken away. I mean, it's absolutely horrible what's taking place it's heartbreaking and so i just had a student uh, from florida that follows me broward county um school resource officer at her school that just waved goodbye to her two weeks ago from his police car when they were dismissing school 
he just passed away from the coronavirus and a young officer, healthy looking officer. She sent a picture to me and, you know, right before I went on. And, and, and then these are people that connect with me uh, through social media, you know, and, and they feel like sharing these stories. And that was a story that that's heartbreaking, which goes back to my point to we need to appreciate life even more than what we ever have during this time. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I want to I want to jump in right there, Tommy, because you said something a while ago and, and there's a there's a post circling around social media that that God has somewhat set reset humanity, you know, um, and my heart and prayers go out to everyone who has lost someone to the coronavirus. I am definitely not minimizing COVID-19 at all. Right. But I totally I see your perception. I get it. I agree with you. I'm sure Chris does, too. Uh, this tragedy has also offered a solution. Uh, families are not buying fast food anymore. We're sitting down with home cooked meals. Uh, my wife and son and I played Clue yesterday, you know, and, and we all won. And it was family bonding time as to where normally hey, I would hey, be hey, running hey, everywhere. Let me interrupt him. They did not all win. They did not all yeah. win. Jimmy was we, in the corner. They, that's not, that's not Chris, true. We all Chris, won one game each. Chris, let, let, let Jimmy, <laughs> got a let participation Jimmy trophy. Let, let Jimmy <laughs> but it's it's amazing, right? Like um, this this sudden tear between myself and physical contact has opened a door for me to have spiritual contact with my God. You know, I've got a long time to grow spiritually. I can actually pay attention uh, to the things that matter now. You know, I get to be present in my children's life instead of, uh, you know, my agenda has always been to help. Uh, it seemed like looking back now at a month ago, I was more prioritized in saving the city and spreading a message of hope than I was in being involved in my own house, you know? And so this really, this really provided uh, a chance for me to sit down and look at the man in the mirror and see what was important. So powerful. That, that outlook is something that I think probably Chris and myself were experiencing the same thing. Jimmy, you're always on the go. Chris, you as well. I mean, you're doing great things in the community and, and, and then, you know, even me, you know, it, it, it kind of made me realize, hey, uh, it's time to spend more time at home with family, cook some meals. Um, probably the only board game that I'm really good at is Sorry. Um, other than that, um, it's it's <laughs> it's, uh, it's beyond my speed. But but the point is just to, to have some fun and uh, appreciate life even more. So I love that yeah. that aspect and outlook, Jimmy. Yeah. yeah. So, hey, so great, uh, great segue into what I wanted to ask you next. Um, talking about being a part and, and engaged in the community. You've been doing uh, community policing for a long time. Uh, long well, time. Well, be, well before uh, you became well known before for it. Uh, talk to us about if there. So one question I have is, was there a time where you actually made a conscious effort from us versus them, or were you always um, bringing a positive ripple to the community? Well, it goes back way beyond I became a from when I became a police officer. Um, June of this year, we'll, we'll, I'll start my twenty second year in law enforcement. But um, so that would have been nineteen ninety eight. But in the eighties is when it started for me. Um, as a teenager, my mom taught all of her kids uh, to give back. And so it started at a young age. When I became a police officer, I would say that um, it probably opened more eyes because I don't know that a lot of people were used to seeing police officers getting out of their police cars and really getting to know people in the community. Absolutely. That's, that's something I did way before uh, I decided to to, uh, to join the, the law enforcement family. And so it's just been a way of life for me, Chris. It's something that, you know, uh, I would eat it and breathe it and sleep it. And literally it was in my DNA. It's just, if I'm not giving or loving or caring for somebody, then I'm just, I'm not a really a happy person. My heart's not beating the way that it should. Yeah. That's a great point because maybe, maybe the us versus them mentality was because, because I was up to something. No good. 
you know, and, and I give officers a chance to try to help me. I know, I think Jimmy can relate. You know, I, I was more interested in, um, you know, not wanting to befriend anybody when I was out there in public doing, doing my drinking. Um, in, in fact, there was an officer Desmond in Oregon who I was on a first name basis with. And at any time he was around, um, it, it was, I mean, I know he wanted to help me looking back on it, but I, I mean, I was running, you know, and, 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 he I, was chasing. and I want to have an opportunity to share how I met both of you, um, which is really, really powerful. If I have that yeah. at some point, um, you know, really cool stories, funny stories with Jimmy, it gets funnier by the moment, but yeah, right. <laughs> It does. <laughs> it's true. I was sitting here thinking, uh, y- you know, it- it's no secret. Anybody who's ever read anything about me or followed my social media stuff, then you know that the majority of my life was in and out of the backseat of a police car. Right. Like uh, my life, I-, I was the division line that Chris and you were just speaking on. Right. Like there was a you and there was a us. And the police had one job, and that was to put me in jail. And so my job was to make sure that you couldn't catch me, which I was terrible at until we played the kickball game between recovery and police, by the way. No, I know you didn't. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, uh, but, but, you know, it's amazing, Tommy, that I haven't had any trouble with law enforcement since the day I got sober and clean. Why, why is that? Can I ask you that? Yeah, because you you guys went from being the problem to part of my solution. Like, let let me be, you know, I, I was in and out of incarceration, a former gang member. I grew up in North Little Rock, Arkansas, in Silver City Courts. Uh, so I always had something extra to prove. Not only was I a gang member, but I was white uh, in a predominant black neighborhood. Um and so it seemed like I always had something else to do. And you guys were part of that problem. You were, and, and, you know, that was a perception. It was a culture upbringing. And, and suddenly, and let me tell you now, I don't have to play tough now. You threaten me, I'm calling the police so quick. Not only am I going to call you Tommy Norman, but I'm going to be out there waving a the flag, talking about that's him. He needs to be in handcuffs, and I'm going with you. Tell you it. know, <laughs> yes, I'm going to tell it. Uh, you know, there's – it really – went from being scared of you guys to being grateful for law enforcement. Does that make sense? It does. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, I, I consider, I consider Tommy and, and, you know, uh, director lane and a whole ton of law enforcement from around, from around the state, uh, friends. I mean, real, truly friends. I got to tell you this, Tommy, you're going to love this story. Uh, Jimmy, uh, was obviously in and out of, uh, you know, the Pulaski County jail and, you know, once he, or twice, <laughs> he was telling me the first time he went, he was scared, didn't know what was going on. The second time he was there, he was actually making some acquaintances. And then the third time he was there, he was like, where's my mail? So he was like, uh, you know, the, the progression of him getting comfortable. Um, but anyway, so he was working on getting a peer recovery program inside the Pulaski County Jail. And he had invited me over for a tour. And when I went in there, Jimmy is in a full suit. And he's talking to about 40 or 50 uh, people who were incarcerated and something really amazing happened that I got to witness. You know, sometimes we get to look in, in, you know, God's miracle just really slaps you in the face and, and you can't deny it. And so I'm looking at these people start to recognize Jimmy. They didn't even recognize him. These are people that he sat in there with. And they were like, J-Bo, is that you? And they were starting to, you know, pop up from their bunk and look at him. And he's in there, you know, sharing his message of hope. And, you know, I, I was uh, watching this and I was like, you know, that, that isn't that what recovery is all about? It's, you know, recovery and the actions we take and the, the positive ripples that we begin to apply to our life is supposed to make us look, feel, behave differently. Yes. Right. You, you, you see that. Uh, you, I mean, you've seen that probably your whole career. You've got to witness some of those uh, some of those cases right. where someone is someone's lost in the darkness and then now they're a lighthouse for others. And to me, it goes back to to Jimmy. I've I've experienced that. But you, the way you tell the story, Chris, is so powerful that when Jimmy goes and visits <clears throat> you know, a prison or, or, or jail and people are popping up out of their bunks and they 
can't believe it's Jimmy and, and it's Jimmy in a different, he's a different person in a different light. Um, but it, it's, we're all in this together. So yeah. Jimmy, I'm no better than you. You're no better than me. And the same with Chris, because if you, if you get too big for your britches, so to speak, as my mom would say, never get too big for your britches. That's where we run into a problem. So as a police yeah. officer to a recovering addict, I'm no better than you. I'm no better than you. We're, we, you know, it, it's maybe you've made some decisions in life that have set you back, but it's my job as a police officer and not really just as a police officer, but just as a person who cares about humanity. I want to do my part in making your life better, but also to hold you accountable. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, Jimmy, Jimmy and my uh, law enforcement uh, interactions are, are a lot different. Mine, I was just an annoyance. I mean, every time the officers saw me, they're like, you know, you're, you're being a disruption and, and, uh, you know, I, cause I, I, I couldn't stay at home. I'd go public with my drinking and I'd get too loud and obnoxious and they, they, you know, <laughs> take me down there. And, uh, you know, one, t- one time uh, I'll just give you a little snapshot into, what it was like. I'm sitting in there in the, the holding cell and I'm, uh, they're trying to get the information from me. Like, you know, what's my name? Where's my address? And, you know, it was in the, you know, the nineties. And so, you know, Dana Carvey on SNL was really, uh, funny when he was doing George Bush impersonation. So I started doing those to the officers saying, you know, like George Bush and then Ross Perot, like, can I finish? Let me say something. Can I finish? Or, you know, jumping back and saying, not going to do it, wouldn't be prudent. And then so they, you know, the officers just would get tired of running around with me. And so um, they saw that, you know, that the, the, my story um, was a downward spiral, obviously, and they wanted to help, but they, I mean, they couldn't because they didn't have a willing participant. I, I talk about that officer Desmond, who uh, was the person I saw most. I guess I would go public when his shift would start or something. I don't know. Um, but uh, I had a pattern and I ran into him. And after I turned my life around, I ran into him about five years later and he had followed me a little bit um, through some other channels and saw that I was doing positive. And so he actually uh, told me that when he saw people that were struggling the same way I did, he would say, look, I know that you can find a way out. I know for sure, positively, 100%, because this guy over here did. And so that that was really meaningful. And I think that was the, one of the first times where I saw, okay, I'm going to be shoulder to shoulder with law enforcement and helping people overcome the fear, the anger, the resentment towards uh, law enforcement as a whole. You know, sometimes that, that uh, you know, takes over what you're trying to do. When you see negativity in the in the media or in the world of law enforcement, that, that interrupts what you're trying to do. And so, have you you've had experience with that, right? Right. Um, you know, but but at the same time, you know, with you talk about how you were being booked in and and you weren't being a willing participant. Um, it, it takes patience, you know, from a police officer, from not just an officer, but anybody that's in the direct line of trying to assist someone in, in recovering. Uh, and so it's something that, as you both know, it's not going to happen overnight. It would just be the same with an officer going into a community and, and trying to win that community over. It's going to take some weeks uh, and some months for it to happen, but with a lot of commitment, it will happen. And so well, you bring up a great point. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think, let me, let me jump in here real quick and let's talk about stigma, Chris. Uh, Arkansas, has done something amazing, right? Like it's it's no secret the state of Arkansas is in the spotlight for recovery efforts nationally, right? Like we're making noise on the forefront of recovery in this state. We've got buy-in from the governor's office, the drug director's office, DHS believes in it. Uh, and we've done some amazing stuff, which is what really links uh, me and you up, Tommy, was uh, when I made I reached out. And of course, uh, my boss, the, the drug director, Kirk Lane, uh, had a long history with law enforcement, too. And so it was real easy to bring us together. Um, and so we we decided we were going to have a kickball tournament 
between local law enforcement officers and the recovery communities. And so we had multiple teams of people in recovery from addiction and law enforcement. And we, we did this to, to show that uh, two different worlds can come together share different stories, get to know each other. And it was amazing. It was a day of of just uh, triumph for both sides. Like we got to know each other, Tommy. Stories were shared and it wasn't from the backseat of a police car on the way to North Little Rock book it. You know, th there was real healing that took place that day. And there was also some real injuries uh, that took place that day. Tommy who has spent his life in the streets bringing the community together. And Les Cup, I hope you're watching because you tried to you tried to just, just tore up Tommy's Don't turn the world on, turn the world on Les. They're going to go after him. <laughs> <laughs> you can't be hurt to Tommy Norman now. I, you know yeah. what? Thank you. I never knew the guy's name. I'm going to write it down. I never knew what his name was. Uh -oh. <laughs> you can give him a ticket. I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking, but go ahead. Fin finish your story. It is a powerful. Story. You're about to you're about to have a citizen's arrest on this guy now. But there's already people knocking on his door, Jimmy. So let me tell you guys this: Les has had multiple conversations with me. I mean, his heart was tore up about Tommy's leg when he when he learned. So Tommy's, uh, you know, refereeing this this tournament. So we got Tommy Norman and we got the state drug director as, as umpires of the kickball game. And Les is running for first place, base, and he's trying to not get out. And Tommy Norman's right there in between the base and Les. <laughs> and he couldn't move fast enough, man. And, and I mean, it was so uh, – like when Les looked up, Tommy and Les were about 15 feet apart. That's how hard they hit. And, uh, man, and, and he, he's been tore up about that a lot because you were there to do something amazing. Right, right. To bridge a gap between law enforcement and people who once were a problem for society. Right? right. We went from addiction. We went from being a destructive force to a contribution to our community. We're no longer taking. We're giving back. And, and so we were all there that day to show the world that we can overcome any stigma or difference. And you got hurt in an effort to help bridge that gap. So on behalf of Les and myself and Chris and all of the recovery community, we love you and we thank you for what you've done. Well, and thank, so thank you. You know, the injury, it, 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 everything happens for a reason. I know that uh, there's a silver lining through all of that. And when I see Les, I want to give him a big old hug. Um, well, there he is on the screen. <laughs> what is it? Oh, Les, what's He's up, Les? Here. So <laughs> let me let me tell the correct story. Les, Les actually was on defense, and somebody kicked the ball way up in the air, and I hear Les's feet running through the grass, and it was one of those kick kicks that went way up in the air, and so I'm looking at the ball. Les is looking at the ball. We're not looking at each other. I'm trying to get out of his way. <laughs> Next thing you know, I am um, – uh, trying to figure out what day of the week it was and where I was because uh, I was <laughs> – he hit me so hard that I had sunglasses on my head. I thought they had been knocked off, but they never were. I was on the ground looking for my sunglasses. They were on my head the whole time. I don't know if Les, <laughs> I don't know if Les played football in, back, in, back in his day, but now Les uh, – anyway, <laughs> love you, man. And let, let me say something about the, the kickball tournament. You're right. There were police officers hugging people, shaking people's hands. When I say people – recovering addicts a shout out to uh director kirk lane i love that man finally had an honor to meet him and everybody else that was there it, it was a great idea i know we're going to do it again this year and so yeah hopefully yeah but kudos to you jimmy for for putting that together and i remember when we, when we met at burns park to do a promotional video and i should have known something then chris because jimmy headbutted me <laughs> that's true hey true story. To some of that shine off yeah i was that, just trying that, to get a little of your shine on my head i should have known something then it was finally Les's way of knocking a police officer down that he just did it in a in a different kind of way but i'm totally being being funny here but uh but no it was great it really was and I'm better. Uh, I've got about a little under two months before I finally return back to work. That injury happened on November the 2nd. October 31st was the last time I put my uniform on. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, But I've enjoyed the break. I just need to try to, uh, once I'm released from physical therapy, jog off some of these pounds I put on through uh, my injury and now the uh, self-isolation. <laughs> yeah. 
So we, we want to have the kickball tournament again this year. We were set for November. Uh, and then the COVID-19, man, um, you know, I, I hope maybe we'll have a vaccine by then and be able to do it. Uh, one thing, though, you know, it was really amazing for me, Tommy, because there were multiple law enforcement agencies there that arrested me. Right. Like, of course, my history with North Little Rock being my hometown, uh, they were there and uh, new relationships were, were built. I met uh, Officer Shelby, uh, who's over the police athletic team. And Great so we guy. partnered. Great guy. Yeah, he's amazing. Uh, uh, love that guy. And so we, we set it up again as an all weekend tournament this time. We were going bigger, like a two day tournament. And um, we were going to have 15, 20 different teams of recovery and law enforcement. And, and so I'm really praying that, that God opens a way for that to happen because it's such a beautiful thing, you know, and uh, Lone Oak Sheriff, uh, Sheriff John Staley was there and, and, you know, it was personal rival with he and I, uh, you know, he's mentored me along my recovery journey, but I, I got clean in his jail. That's, that's when I hit my bottom and found recovery. And one thing I knew for a fact, no matter what happened that day, Tommy Norman, Sheriff's Don Lone Oak County was not fixing to win. Not that day. Uh, and we smoked him. Man, it, it was like every everything he ever did to make me mad, we got even that day. 17 to nothing. They didn't took stand out, a chance. Took it out on him that day. That was a pretty nasty blowout, too, by the way. <laughs> hey, hey, uh, hey uh, that wasn't the first time you've been involved in any kind of like sporting event to, to rep a cause. Um, I saw that you had just recently done a little throwback session on your Instagram stories and saw that you, you got to actually participate in uh, the Car Harlem Globe Trotters. How was, how was that? That it looked was really a fun. Lot of fun. The Harlem Globe Trotters came to town and asked me to uh, participate. And it's a little different than the, uh, than the, you would think that playing a basketball game, I would have tore my ACL. But <laughs> anyway, it was really a big honor. They gave me three chances to make a shot. They they told me before we went out on the court, three chances. First shot I missed, and you've got these thousands of people of Verizon Arena watching. Second shot I missed. Last chance is a layup, and I made it. And I was like, thank you, God. Thank you, God. <laughs> yeah, you yeah, can't miss the layup. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and so it was. It was uh, anytime anybody reaches out to me, even through social media on a time that we're at home and uh, we're, like I said, we're all in this together and, and I just, it's, it's yeah. just, uh, it's a big honor just to be able to, to kind of share my story and hopefully, uh, join you all in inspiring other people to get out and, and make a difference. Definitely not yeah. first them. Hey, I know that, uh, some of our, our viewers, uh, that are watching right now may not be familiar with the pop tart story. Oh, the pop tart. Yeah. So that was probably in. 2015, 2014, 2015. Yeah, that's um, about when we met. We met in 2015. Right. This was just a little skit where um, there, there was a, a young man in the back of my police car. He's probably eight or nine years old. And some kids that ran up to me and said he had stolen a Pop-Tart. And I asked what kind of Pop-Tart it was. It was a cinnamon Pop-Tart. I've got my <laughs> note. I've got my notepad out. I'm writing down this information. All right, we've got a cinnamon, two cinnamon Pop-Tarts that were taken. And and the next thing you know, I've got my back to my police car and these kids are screaming, Officer Norman, he's getting away. He's getting away. So he's running. He escaped from the back of my police car with the Pop-Tarts and I chase him and I lose him. Golly. That was the key right. thing and I've it ever was seen. A, it was a skit. You know, I mean, he didn't really. So he OK, yeah. But it, I mean, yeah, it was so it was, it was really I mean, cool. And so now, uh, you know. Cinnamon pop tarts. I never, I never look at the same. I can never catch them. So, anyway. I actually have that video. <laughs> I almost uploaded that for your intro <laughs> to show people who may not have known who I you are. The intro, but I'm going to go back and watch this. Um, but I've been able, I've been fortunate to pull from the archives and just post a bunch of throwbacks uh, of, of just interactions in the community um from from just years and years and years ago so anyway it's pretty cool but i think that i think that's important the reason i brought that up is because i think a lot of people are sitting at home um they've done their chores or or they're just you know going through their photos and their history and and trying to grasp on some of that those positive memories right, right. and i think that that's important if you i mean share those things i, I want to encourage everybody who's watching if you have positive memories 
uh, share them because right now we're continuing to be bombarded with uh, just a lot of negative, a lot of negative stuff. People are, I mean, if you really look for it, you can see people are fighting. People are not getting along right now. People are uh, hurting uh, in, in a lot of pain. Um, this, this COVID-19 is really damaging a lot of people. And, and so um, I encourage everybody to, to continue to fight back with those positive uh, ripples, right? Exactly. Yeah, share, share that hope, you know. What I don't care if it's a picture of one of your pets or your kids or, or your, your, you know, your, uh, you've got chalk and you're, you're, you're drawing something on your, your sidewalk or, or anything. Just share. You never know a picture of anything that's going to brighten someone's day. And that's what we all need to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. One of the, one of the memories that came up in my Facebook feed this morning is my daughter uh, two years ago was doing gymnastics and the whole class is following what the instructors tell them to do. They're doing these back bends, except her. She is exercising her independence and she has her, she's sitting Indian style with her back to everybody. And I'm like, what, are, you know, it's really cute, but uh, I'm like, now's not the time to be exercising your independence. Uh, you know, you need to do the back bend while we're paying this money for you to do gymnastics. <laughs> I've got, I've got to share that uh, Chris and I met at the Wolf Street red, uh, red carpet event. Um, yeah. And then we had, now, now that's also a recovery event too, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And then, so Chris and I decided to meet up again and, and kind of share more of stories and we're sitting, having coffee and I'm um, Chris, you, you smell really good. What are you, what are you, what are you wearing? <laughs> no joke. I, there's, it's a true story. I know. Yeah, no, this is true. And, and then I, and then had to copy off his sock game. He has some really crazy socks, but he was wearing the cologne Invictus. Yes, so, love that oh, stuff. Love me some Taco Rabone. So an hour later, I'm at Dillard's waiting for them to open, and I go and ask for the Chris Dickey special. No, I asked for Invictus. And so anyway, <laughs> and then I go and, and, and take a tour of the uh, recovery clinic. Uh, uh -huh. What is the place? What is the place? Okay, over on Cantrell. Natural state. Yeah, it's natural, natural state, state recovery. Okay. And then I'm walking. He's walking me out to my car. I'm like, Chris. You smell good again, man. What is that? <laughs> but then, but then, he, but then he gave me a sample of that cologne, and once that was out, as a matter of fact, it's right up there, and it's uh, let me tell you, and because of Chris, I get a lot of compliments uh, on my cologne. Thank you, Chris. Hey, hey you're so welcome. What was the That's second bottle? bottle? Uh, it was uh, something absolute. It's oil based. Okay. Yes. Okay. It's, yes. So anyway, but that's so I like Versace. Smelling good. Clear is bottle. Good. Right, right. Yeah. Jimmy, Jimmy, where's that cool water? Cool water. <laughs> Jimmy, Jimmy, nineties. So, I man. used to, I used to like when I was in my prime, when I was young, handsome, and thugged out. Cool water was the way to go. Jimmy gets the uh, cologne that you get at the checkout at Walmart. It burns your skin. Yeah. Remember that. <laughs> hey, when, when Jimmy's feeling insecure, he dabs a little bit of that cool water to make him confident. <laughs> Yeah. So look, look, I see Sheriff Staley's on the screen. I no, never I'm get Staley. invited Let to function. Finally got to I seen pictures of John with you and him, and I knew the great work that he does. Finally got to meet him too at the uh, kickball tournament. And I, I got to meet his family. That guy right there is absolutely amazing. So hello, hey, Sheriff. It was the greatest thing, Tommy. It was for my I, team I'm excited to for kick November. his butt. Do you you yeah. guys don't understand. November, it's <laughs> going to happen. We're claiming it now. In November, we're, we're going to be good. We're going to get back out there and play some kickball. I think I'm going to watch from my car, but I will be yeah. there. <laughs> <laughs> it's it, safe from the car. He's going to be flying a drone. He's going to be doing a ref from a drone. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just taking so, home with y'all FaceTime me. So anyway. <laughs> Matt Burke says, I still have a bottle. Of cool water cologne. Cool water does it doesn't smell too bad. I mean, but it's cool. It's timeless, right? Right. <laughs> and so Chelsea McGill, shout out to my wife, just hit us with the old Snoop Dogg lyrics that actually made cool water cool. I got the Johnson's baby powder and cool water cologne. <laughs> That's what made cool water pop, right there. Oh, hello, Chelsea. Thank you so much for taking care of that bald headed, beautiful husband of yours. I, I am handsome. I will say thank you, Tommy. I got you less on the hug. I'm hugging you less. 
<laughs> It'll be safe. <laughs> and let's see. Uh, John Staley said, you guys are great. Well, thank you, Sheriff. I owe a lot of it to you. If you wouldn't have been mean to me and slapped handcuffs on me, I wouldn't have decided to change. <laughs> Just thought I'd throw that out there. Uh, let's see. Coach is my favorite. That's from Wade Carter. I'm strolling through these comments. You guys feel free to chat. I can't. Yeah. Uh, I, I, for some reason on my end, the comments are coming up, but not, I don't think, quite as as uh, as, as, as frequent. Um, yeah. Jimmy, let me, let me – I, I want to ask talk. Jimmy a question. Go ahead. Jimmy, um, you, you know, through, through everything that you went through, and I, I don't think I know the actual date, but – what date, what was a date in your life, what year maybe, um, that you finally decided, okay, it, it's time to stop. It's time to turn my life around because I, I would like to hear at least some of that story. Yeah. So uh, December of 2014, uh, I was found non-responsive. Uh, I'm, I'm leaving Jacksonville. I'm in Jacksonville, Arkansas at the time. And I... Hey, what is that? Hang on a second, guys. My son's in here. Thanks, bud. It scared me. I was like, wait, they're back. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's oh, it's, getting right. <laughs> it's it's 2014. Uh and I'm non-responsive. I make this wrong turn that takes me into Lone Oak County. I've never really been to Lone Oak County, uh, in the rural part of it. And so this wrong turn ended up being the one right turn that I made in my life. Uh, it saved my life. I was found non-responsive in a car. Uh, I had a substantial amount of drugs in my lap. Um, I had passed out. Uh, just my body had completely shut down. Um, I had been up, discontent, discombobulated. I wasn't functioning right at all, Tommy. Uh, and so I collapsed and it just so happened to be in a church parking lot of all places. Like for me to, 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 for all this to take place. And, and so I wake up, uh, to a canine officer named, uh, Michael Davis from Lone Oak County. Uh, he was a good cop too. He was a lot like you eat it. He wasn't mean to me. He, you know, he knocked on the window. And so I wake up. I was I was so out of it, so heavy, Tommy, that I don't know where I'm at. I don't know what's going on. And I'm angry at this officer for doing his job. He's knocking on the window to make sure I'm alive, that I'm, I'm not an overdose case like we see all the time in cars and parking lots. And I'm mad that he just woke me up. Now, I'm on parole. I don't have a driver's license. I roll the window down. He says, sir, are you OK? So I'm going to, in my mind, Tommy, I'm going to play this. I'm going to reverse psychology, this trained officer of the law who's <laughs> trained to deal with people like me. And I say, no, I'm not OK. I was just taking a nap. I'm on parole and I ain't got no driver's license. Let's just get that out of the way. And he, he looks at me and he's like, sir, can you step out of the car? And I had forgot that I had drugs on me. And so I get out of the car and the dope just fell out of my lap onto the concrete. And uh, it was like a 1980s song playing in slow motion. It was like it all came running back to me then. Uh, and so I felt this pit of misery. Like I'd already been incarcerated five times in the State Department of Corrections. Uh, at that time, I'd already done about 13 years off and on. And it was all I knew. But this time I knew it was different. Uh, this time I knew that going back on the amount of times that I've been sentenced, that I would not get out of prison again. Uh, and if I did, I would be too old to have a life worth living. And so I'm miserable. I'm, I'm in Lone Oak County Jail. Uh, don't know where I'm at. All my life, I've been this tough guy, Tommy. I've, I've been the tried to be the toughest kid in the room. And all of a sudden, and the jails I've been in, you wear orange, you know, and everybody's, you know, you're thugged out, you're flexing, you're in your wife beaters. And I wake up, I got this cellmate. He doesn't have any teeth and he's in my face like this, smiling. And I'm like, and I'm in pink. 
And so I'm shocked that I'm in a pink jumpsuit. And I remember, I'll never forget it. I said, man, where are we at? And he said, you're in Lone Oak County Jail. And I looked and he was in pink. And so something in my mind said, we're in the wrong pod. So I leaned up and I said, I think we're in the wrong pod. And, and he just laughed at me. He said, no, everybody wears pink. And they do a little County. different. <laughs> they do yeah. things a little different. <laughs> you want to talk about an image breaker. <clears throat> like, how can you pretend to be tough in pink? Right. And I don't mean just pink. I mean, it's you're in a bright, solid, fluorescent pink. It's real pink. It's woman pink. Like, and, right. and there's no, there's no, you know, it was just a, it, it was something that, that clicked in my head, you know, and uh, so I'm miserable. I don't remember signing my parole violation papers, uh, but something that happens, it was like, uh, you know, sometimes I can be charismatic. And so uh, my charisma started to surface with the drugs out of my system. And Sheriff Staley uh, liked me and he moved me up front with a prison sentence, uh, he moved me up front and made me a trustee. Um, and so all of a sudden I made a very miserable situation tolerable. And so wait, wait, wait. let me interrupt real quick. I got to ask a question. The, the 13 cu cumulative years that you've done, ha did any law enforcement person ever do that for you? What, what state for you right then? Well, no, I had never had it as easy as I had it in a jail like that. So what well, you've I'm got under something in you, seeing something in you and giving you a chance to to build trust. Had no, that ever happened? Not, that's not, not like that's it did an then. Important thing to, that's an important thing to to note because I can relate to that too. And to Tommy's point, he was wondering what, what was the change? What was the, well, the factor that led to you to change? And I, I have a similar story too. So keep and, going. And that's that's what I'm getting to. Um so at the time, I think I've made a decision. I'm never using again. Like the dope has ruined my life. I'm on my way back to prison for the sixth time. I'm done. And so all of a sudden, I made a very intolerable situation. Not quite so bad. Staley moved me up front. I've got a TV that's 60 inches in my cell. I got a, a DVD player. I got a coffee pot. Like I've got it as good as you can have it for being in jail. And then my cellmate, some dope came in the jail and ended up on the floor and my cellmate got it. And he said, man, we're getting high. I said, no, we're not getting high. I'm done. And so uh, all that day, I said, no, Tommy. Um, I said no until I couldn't say no anymore. And I, I turned him down about 16 different times that day. And all of a sudden, I couldn't turn him down at more. I knew I didn't want to get high, but I got high anyway. Uh, it took Sheriff Staley about two hours to notice something was bad wrong with us. And uh, the next week, I was sitting in prison. He locked me down. Uh, he came in my cell, and he had tears in his eyes. And he was, he was mad, like we had hurt him. And something clicked that day. If I don't do anything, I'm going to show this guy that I can do this. And I haven't got high since. Uh, that was uh, my clean date is February 27th of 2015. That's five years in a month. So so do you feel like that the kindness Sheriff Staley uh, showed you, even though you decided to smoke and you ended up in prison, you, you felt like, OK, this is finally one person that saw through me. So you felt like that you owed him and you owed him enough to prove to him, not just to prove to him, but prove to yourself that um, you wanted to turn your life around and that was it. So something happened that day. Uh, Staley definitely plays a big part in that, you know, right. and he plays a part in my future from that moment. Um, it was the powerlessness, the fact that I used against my will, the fact that the thing that I'd always considered my solution had suddenly become my biggest problem. Not only did it ruin my life, but it ruined my jail life that I had made good. So something happened that day when Staley took away all those privileges and threw me in the hole. I realized that the dope even ruined my life while I was in jail. Hmm. I couldn't escape the devastation. Yeah. You know, Tommy, a lot of people in long-term recovery can, can relate to the, what we talk about, like this perfect storm happening. You have all of these elements coming together at the same time. And then the the miracle of recovery 
kind of has its roots after that. Uh, and, and, you know, after a storm, sometimes there's a beautiful landscape, right? And that's kind of like uh, what, what mine was like. I, I mean, I was, I was desperate, um, in despair, had been telling the same story over and over and over. Um, and I was so tired of that story. Like, hey, I'm, I was trying and then I fell. I was turning my life around and then I fell. I was doing things right and then I fell. Uh, and, and so I, I definitely didn't want to do that anymore. Um, and, and then that perfect storm happened. The right people came into my life. The right situations happened. Uh, just mm -hmm. it, it, it's no other way to put it other than saying it was divine. So for me, did you I know Jimmy shared his story 2014 and he drove to, to Lono County. But was was there a day that was your perfect storm? Was, was there a moment? that do you mind sharing? Because I, I don't, I've never heard it. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, you know, a lot of the, a lot of my story where, you know, I'm an, I'm an overdose survivor. Uh, I was uh, in and out of uh, law enforcement. Um, in one year I was arrested 14 times and um, I was unemployable. All of those things didn't cause me to change direction. It was still I was still on that downward spiral. Anybody looking out, uh, out from outside within would say, why didn't he turn his life around when he almost died? I mean, wh what's wrong? Why can't he turn his life around when he can't keep a job or, or why can't he turn his life around because he's in trouble? Uh, you know, you, family, society asked those questions. I was asking those questions. I just couldn't get off the ride. And I so desperately wanted to. And then in 2007, my perfect storm happened. I had run into a, a person that I trusted uh, who took a chance on me, similar to what Jimmy was talking about with Staley. Um, for some reason, I wanted to keep this job I had as a waiter at a Colton's over in Batesville, Arkansas. I was on my last straw um, and uh, I was in this relationship with my now wife, Tara, you know, um, and, and she was getting ready to, to call it quit. And so I had all of those things kind of coming to a head. And I was like, all right, I think I'm desperate enough to actually do something different. Because see, the, the thing that I was doing, Tommy, was I would um, I had been trying to, to turn my life around for a long time at that point. And what what uh, what would keep happening is I would continue to do it my way, what I thought was right. What I and, and if you told me something that challenged what I thought. I was probably not going to, you know, I was not going to be successful. And so what, what, until I was willing to completely uh, turn my life over to a, a different set of principles, a different set of suggestions and, and put everything I thought I knew and all of my experiences in the parking lot while I could try something different is when I really uh, was able to uh, find the, the gift of recovery. Mm. Powerful stories. I, I, I don't remember ever hearing either one of your stories and, Chris, I remember, you know, sitting down next to you at the Wolf Street uh, red carpet event. And at the time was my fiance, Roslyn, who's now my wife. And we sat next to each other and I, I was I whispered to Roslyn. I was like, you know, this Chris guy is really nice. Uh, but where are the people that are in recovery or have recovered? Because you. I mean, the way you turned your life around and the way you carry yourself, I would have never even thought that you would have been through what you've been through. And, and so, you know, just thank you for there has to be so much courage involved. Obviously, God's involved and family. But I mean, I mean you, you know, and the same with Jimmy, you know, uh, it's just amazing. And it's just a testimony um, that it can happen, you know, and I'm so glad yeah. that you are the faces of not just locally, but to me, the state of Arkansas beyond, because when I think about advocates for recovery, I think about both of you. And I know there's other people out there that are doing their, that are doing their, their work, but, uh, Chris, for people that aren't familiar with what you, uh, you, you just took a, a an, a, an, an empty abandoned, high school can you let people know that are following from across the world even here that don't know what you turned it into yeah we're planning on turning that into a recovery center uh, i think that what jimmy was talking about uh earlier is um with with all of the, 
addiction medicine is in a, in a major disruption right now. And yeah. Arkansas is finally in a position uh, where we're leading this effort to change the landscape of how we approach individuals who are suffering from addiction um, with, 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 peer, with the addition of peer recovery, with uh, a holistic approach to treatment, um, not just, uh, you know, this old antiquated uh, process of doing things. You have a lot of creative people uh, who are uh, on the, in the trenches on the front lines that are literally uh, changing the way uh, uh, of how we do things. And Arkansas is really leading that effort. And yeah. so we, we had a unique opportunity to fill some gaps in what we thought were, were in the treatment industry. And one of those is, uh, I guess, buying an old high school. Now, I've, I've got it. This is kind of funny uh, that you that you brought that up because, you know, I didn't graduate high school. And a judge actually uh, saved my life and ordered me to get a GED instead of sending me to jail. You know, he said you know, he saw something in me and said, hey, I want to I want to try to salvage this guy. And uh, if you don't get your GED, then we're going to have some problems. But, but I was able to I was able to get that GED. And then when when I got to Arkansas, I finished my uh, two year college degree and then so on and so on. Um, but. You know, when I was working in the, you know, my, my background is in higher education administration and we'd go out to lunch with colleagues and we, you know, when you work in higher education, there's no degree that you go to school for higher education. You know, my background was in accounting. Uh, some of my colleagues in art, science, a lot of different degrees come together and, and that's how you kind of get into administration and, and higher ed. And so we were going around the table, just kind of talking about our backgrounds and what degrees we have. And I said, you know what? I didn't even graduate high school. And they started laughing and they did just, they didn't believe me <laughs> like what you're talking about. Like, that's the gift of recovery. Should I shouldn't look the way I, I shouldn't look. Uh, I certainly don't smell the way I did when I got uh, sober. <laughs> Thanks to Dillard right, uh, and, right. and their staff, you know, um, but but you bring up a good point. I mean, like, you know, if I remain open and, and I keep my heart open and I do th and I just do positive little positive things each day, I don't know what's going to happen to me. I certainly didn't think that I would be uh, where I'm at right now, but people put the things on my heart and you know, I just follow those things. I got to, I got to, you know, that's, that's recovery for me today is, is taking a, taking suggestions from you, from Jimmy, from others uh, in my circle uh, that, uh, you know, talk to me about what, you know, of how we're, how we're doing, uh, making these positive ripples. Can I ask you um, what challenges or what are you concerned about now with social isolation and, and, you know, the, the, the top officials encouraging people to stay home. Jimmy, you mentioned this, but what what problems are drug addicts, are people in recovering or trying to recover? What are they facing now with having to stay at home? Chris, you want to tackle that? Yeah, we both can. I'll start. Um, there's a lot of challenges right now. I mean, we've heard of uh, the opposite of addiction is what? <clears throat> Connection. Exactly. So, uh, Right now, uh, people in recovery that attend uh, twelve step meetings have the option to go, you know, online and do Zoom meetings. And what we're seeing is, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that are, are, you know, idiots that'll go on in there and uh, berate people, belittle people, and and so you know that's another challenge that shouldn't exist, but it does um, for people in recovery. Um, Okay, so for one, me, this is a personal thing. I, I'm I'm super distracted right now. There's, I mean, I'm I'm trying to unplug. Uh, we're playing Mario Kart uh, once a day in the house, and and my seven year old daughter is is getting too good at it. I can't uh, uh, beat her all the time now. My wife's playing, and and so it's very difficult for me to be present. I mean, I'm struggling with that. And so I've yeah. got to like actually look around the room sometimes and say, OK, there's the there's a window. There's a piece of paper just to stay present and to to, to get my mind and my body in, in the same place. And and so I think a lot of uh, people in recovery are, are struggling with that. Um, it's a, it's it's. It's definitely a, a, a critical time for people to 
uh, call somebody uh, if, if they're feeling isolated and, and alone and having some negative uh, thoughts. It's also critical time for people like uh, me, Jimmy. I know you're doing it. You said you're checking in on people. If, if you have people in your life that you uh, haven't talked to in a while, call them on the phone. Uh, try not to send a text. If a text, the only thing you can send, do it, but call them, have that interaction. Um, but th that's, that's just a couple of challenges uh, that, that we're seeing. Um, like, like Jimmy says, the dope house doesn't close. The dope house not closing because of the coronavirus. They're right. there. Um, right. while everything else is closing down, that, that's, that's going to be a, a risk. And so we, we want to definitely prevent that. We're seeing overdose. They're, they're, they're still there. They're happening. Uh, they're rising while, while coronavirus is taking up the airwaves, methamphetamines on the rise, uh, benzodiazepine overdoses are on the rise. Um, Someone mentioned over here due to substance use, uh, you know, domestic violence is on the rise. And so there's a lot of other things that are happening um, that, that create challenges that uh, are definitely preventable um, if we can stay connected. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've the, the numbers say uh, we've got 23 million people in America that are in recovery, long term recovery. Right. And our best numbers point to about 25,000 Arkansans that are living in recovery. And so the meeting locations, whether it be self-help groups, 12 steps, celebrate recovery, the churches are closing anywhere that we could get that physical therapeutic value of the connecting the physical, you know, FaceTime's good, but a hug is better. You know what I mean? Um, and to, to take a practical standpoint, to look at this the same way I would have looked at my addiction. Right. Like this is this is a, a supplement. It will sustain me, but it's not the real thing. In other words, this is cut. It's diluted. <laughs> it, 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 it's never going to replace me being able to walk in a meeting uh, with 50 other people that are like minded that are there to help me hold uh, hold me accountable. So not only are our meeting places gone. Uh, the physical connections are removed, but also the accountability. And so when you look around at states surrounding Arkansas, what you see is a spike in the relapse rate. You see people f leaving recovery and returning to drug use. And, and, and you look at the overdose numbers. Like, I'm not just talking smoke. Like, I work for the office of the drug director. I've seen the data. Like, what we see, is, is, and if we base our projection uh, then that's what's coming to Arkansas. But the difference is recovery leaders like Chris, like myself, uh, I've seen different independent people jump out on social media trying to get ahead of this and curve it, right? Like the more solutions we offer, like the recovery clinic is a resource station. You can come and you can find resources. You can hear Chris and people like you, Tommy, offer that hope. Like, and, and I want to say this too. The people I'm worried about in recovery in Arkansas are newcomers. Like, like I've made a decision. I'm not going to use no matter what. Okay. And I've got people in my life. I know what I've got to do to sustain my recovery. But can you imagine trying to get sober or clean right now in this time without having a physical place to go into and say, hey, listen, I can't beat it. I've tried. It's going to kill me. What do I need to do? And that community's not there for the newcomer. You know, and, and, and if you're in recovery and you're watching this, I want to tell you something. You are the strongest breed of people alive on this world. We have lived and overcame trials and tribulations that most normal people couldn't. We've survived in prisons. We've survived in crack alleys. We've overcame rape, abuse, trauma. Like there is no more. There, there's no one as strong as we can be. If we pull together and we lean on each other, COVID-19 ain't got nothing on us. We survived a, a pandemic for years. You know, COVID-19 is, is, is terrible. It spreads by touch. But there's another pandemic that has killed 200 Americans a day for years, 16,000 people globally a day for years. And it's addiction. And it ain't went nowhere. It's still here, Tommy. Um. I have a, a question for either one of you, for any police officers out there that are watching this, um, other than arresting drug addicts. Um, I know, Jimmy, that your goal is to bring police and recovering addicts together. But what is something else that police officers out there watching today 
I'm, I'm sure across the world. What is what what is something more that they can do? We talked about what you're doing. What's something more that law enforcement can do to help bridge that gap uh, with recovering addicts to try to form more of a relationship uh, and not a relationship, as Jimmy mentioned, in the backseat of a police car? Yeah. I want to say something real quick about that because Jimmy, Jimmy can obviously speak to peer recovery, but um, I want to, there, there's a, an article I read and I actually wrote about it or cited them in a, in a article I wrote about, uh, for the Democrat Gazette and in Ohio, they actually have, they are connecting peer recovery specialists that uh, when, when an officer is on scene with somebody that uh, may need peer recovery services, uh, they call this person and they go out to the scene and actually talk to the person um, before they're sent to jail. That way they know or or whatever they may they may in fact release them. Uh, and as long as the peer is going to help them get uh, treatment or some other kind of service. Um, I think things like that that are really innovative and out of the box because that stuff doesn't happen. Right. I mean, that's that's really uh, that's that's really new. Um, but Jimmy and, and his team has been able to take peer recovery specialists inside the jails. When's the, I mean, when has that happened in our uh, history where you're putting someone outside of law enforcement and a corrections officer? Um, and and I, I struggled with getting uh, just literature in, in, right. in, into a, a, a jail. So, so let me, let me jump in there real quick, Chris. I want to, I want to, obviously you're, you're, you may not be aware of it, but we have that here too. We've, we've, uh, last year, Kirk Lane got a BJA grant that we're implementing this year uh, that will pair a peer recovery support specialist with a lead overdose investigator. And so what you'll have, and we're putting this in six different locations. So, and we were actually the first state to do it. Now, what you're talking about is a counselor and a police person, but the peer will work beside a law enforcement agent like Tommy, and, and they'll be paired together. And they will not only go out and while, while the investigator is working the overdose, if the person survives, the peer will get them into treatment, be a court advocate, uh, and, and they'll do public education on addiction and recovery at the schools, at the police gatherings. Uh, and we've got enough money to do that in six different locations throughout the state. So just wanted to make sure you guys knew that we, we are doing that. And so and we did take the idea from the very thing Chris was talking about, the Ohio the thing. Yeah. So, but really, I think the it, it all comes down to this too. Be more like Tommy Norman. I mean, yeah. what what for officers that are out there listening? Be more like Tommy Norman. Uh, hug yeah. him with your heart, and and see see past the behavior, see past the the ugliness of addiction. Because I mean, that, you know, you're 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 one of the few that are able to do that you can see the person and, and kind of have the foresight to know that there's a, you know, this may look like coal right now, but this may be a diamond later. You right. know, I'm going to help. This. Right. Well, uh, Sheriff Staley believed in Jimmy and someone believed in you when you talk about your, your perfect storm moment and, and, and more people, not just police officers, but just more people, uh, you, you know, everywhere need to, have more faith and believe that there is a diamond in the rough uh, when, when you're talking about, uh, you know, drug addicts and people that are recovering. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know what Jimmy was talking about with stigma is, and kind of like what, what the purpose of the, the kickball ball tournament was about. You can kind of see, uh, you know, people with addiction aren't bad people trying to get better. They're, they're, they're sick people trying to get well. And, and so if you approach, uh, someone who's suffering from addiction from that perspective, that this person needs help. Uh, this person is, is suffering from, uh, sick. yeah, they're sick. They need some Jimmy, medicine. Uh, Jimmy, you didn't, you forgot to mention uh, another, it was myself, uh, director lane, but also our friend Laura Monteverti uh, was out there as well. And so that was really cool. Yeah. Yeah, she was out there doing her thing too. Uh, she's she's been a real contributor to uh, shedding light and awareness on uh, the recovery movement, right? right? And so, anyway, I, I don't care who you are, or how you're doing it. If you're putting out there the solution, then we need you doing that. You right. know, this this is about how do we do that? How do we 
How do we make the public aware that recovery is real? It is possible no matter how far you've been gone, that anybody is eligible to receive the gift of recovery. Yeah. All right. I know we're running out of time here. Yeah, Tommy, is there anything are. else you want to say to uh, anybody viewing? Uh, well, not well. just for both of you, don't stop what you're doing. Um, because even when you think no one's benefiting from it, that no one's watching you, believe me, people are watching. I'm watching. Uh, social media is a powerful tool. You know, I follow Jimmy. Chris, I follow you. Big fans of, of what you do. And it's not that now we're friends. I feel like that now we're family. And so we're brothers. And, and so we have to look out for each other. For everybody out there watching, please continue to follow the work that these guys are doing and, and, and other people um, that are on the team as well. And, you know, it's just a big honor to be here today. Um, you know, keep the faith. Uh, we're all in this together and we're all going to overcome it together. Absolutely. Absolutely. We're going to get past this uh, pandemic. And I think if we remain uh, vigilant and taking care of ourselves, we're obviously going to come back stronger as a family. Like you said, I think that's important to note that we are all in this together. It's not us versus them. And so if yeah. you see somebody uh, hurting, uh, help them without judgment. Um, again, the recovery clinic is meant to stay uh, as a way for people to find sanctuary and be connected during a disconnected time. Um, yeah. Tommy, we're so grateful that you, uh, gave you, gave us definitely more than an hour of your time today. We know you're, uh, busy. Um, and, and we're going to continue to pray for the all-star family, uh, and, and that they, that they, uh, you know, find peace and calm and, um, amid all this confusion. Thank you. Yeah. And thanks for having me on. I'm looking yeah. forward to yeah. uh, joining, joining you again sometime. And so guys, real quick, before we close, I want to let you know that Wednesday at 11, the recovery clinic will go live again. If you're watching and you haven't went to the page yet, the URL is the recovery clinic AR for Arkansas. So if you will just go like and follow that page, we would love to have you guys interact with us and help us uh, share the solution. Wednesday's guest uh, with Chris Dickey and myself will be the Arkansas Department of Health giving you updates on COVID-19 testings. And again, Chris and I will be there to tie it into the recovery solution. Uh, and so if you guys will just bear with me while we close out the screen, uh, thanks everybody for tuning in. We love you and we will see you Wednesday. Thank you. Thanks a lot. See you.